Hey, what's up? It's your boy Rock, and welcome, welcome, welcome to Rock Recompletes, a series in which I take a look back at old games that I've completed to see if my opinion on them still holds up to this day. In this episode, I'm going to be taking a look at Super Mario Galaxy, which was released on the Nintendo Wii in 2007. And fuck me sideways, that fact scares the piss out of me. So, without any further existentialism, let's get right into it. Super Mario Galaxy has always been a strange one for me. I remember when I got the game, I didn't really think much of it. Being a kid, I didn't really know what to do or where to go in the game, and I ended up always just getting frustrated and trying to get to different parts of the Comet Observatory that weren't open to me yet. The whole concept of the game was just weird to me. A few years later, I received the sequel and loved it, so I saw no reason to own this game anymore. I attempted to commit one of the most heinous acts I ever could have thought of. Selling. My. Game. Thankfully, I was diagnosed with adult supervision, and the wicked womb from whence I came declared that sinning was not on the agenda. So my plans were foiled. And would you look at that, I still have the same copy of the game. And a seat next to anyone but Satan. Years later, I attempted to beat the game, and when beating Bowser, I was met with a hearty dose of karma. The game... was incompletable. And so it remained that way for years. All of this culminated in me looking at Galaxy and saying, Wow. That sure is a game. Let's hope to God that's changed. Stop me if you've heard this one, but Super Mario Galaxy stands out among the rest of the series when it comes to story. When conceiving the game, the team decided that they wanted to make Mario Galaxy an epic, cinematic experience. And they did just that. Super Mario Galaxy's story is an absolute masterpiece. The cutscenes are expertly animated, voice acting is used supplementally and thus doesn't take away from the feel of the story, and overall, the plot is just fantastic. The story begins on the night of the Star Festival, a festival that takes place once every hundred years, and Peach has invited Mario to join in the festivities with her. Upon arriving, however, we discover a sky fleet manned by Bowser himself. The airships are laying waste to the Mushroom Kingdom, and this makes for an epic masterpiece of a scene. Bowser then summons a UFO that rips Peach's castle out of the ground, taking it away to the cosmos. Mario manages to remain on the castle until Kamek blasts him with magic and sends him plummeting to the planets below. Mario is awakened by Luma, who introduces us to Rosalina. Rosalina entrusts Luma into our care, and she tasks us with retrieving Grand Stars. After collecting the first one, we fly to the Comet Observatory. The Comet Observatory is the home of Rosalina and the Lumas, and the Grand Star lights the beacon, granting power to the ship. Rosalina explains that she was visiting the planet like she did every 100 years, when a strange force latched onto the ship and began to pull away their power source, the Power Stars. When the ship had lost all its power, it ended a state of hibernation. Bowser was the evil force behind this, and Rosalina pleads that we utilize what small amount of energy the ship has to travel across the universe, collect power stars, and seek vengeance on Bowser. With each grand star we collect, the beacon beams brighter and the ship gains more power, allowing us to reach more galaxies which we access through the domes scattered among the observatory. When the ship has regained enough power, we are able to travel to the center of the universe in one of the most beautiful cinematic cutscenes this game has to offer. Please. Just watch this.
Here we are, the final showdown. We swap split with Bowser a couple other times throughout the game, but this is the battle upon which the fate of the universe relies. We deliver the smackdown of the century to Bowser in a sequence that legitimately gave me goosebumps and made me squee. We nab the final grand star and begin to soar through the sky. We see Peach plummeting towards us, and it finally happens. What? No! My disc was still busted. My game was still incompletable. No. I refuse to accept this. There must there must be something I can do. Anything. I still have hope. I can save the galaxy. I've tried with little hope at cleaning my disc, praying that it would work. We matched Bowser and watched in anticipation as Yes! Oh my god! Yes! Holy shit! That was the happiest I've ever felt playing a game, hands down. And it's not even over. We see Bowser defeated, watching his world crumble around him. His planet implodes on itself and forms a black hole. Everything is engulfed. No words, just an emotional sacrifice. And with the echoing screech of the Lumas, the black hole is engulfed. Rosalina appears before us and explains the life cycles of stars and the universe. She hints that no two cycles are ever the same. And with that, Mario awakes, and the world around him has been saved. All of the characters we met throughout our adventure are within the castle grounds, and the galaxy is saved. What I've talked about so far could more or less make up the story section of this review, but I'd also like to quickly touch on Rosalina's storybook. Entering the library on the Comet Observatory will greet us with Rosalina telling the Lumas a story. The story is very long, but considering how long this section is already, I'll keep it brief. If you head on down to the description, however, I'll leave a link to a video that has the entirety of Rosalina's story. Or play the game yourself, that works too. The story sees a young girl who stumbles across a spaceship, and inside is a small Luma. The Luma has lost its mother, and the girl decides to help the Luma on its quest to find her. She fixes the ship, and they take to the galaxies. Along the way, they recruit more Lumas, and eventually there are hundreds. They build up a home with a library and a kitchen, and it's where they reside. Eventually, the girl begins to miss her mother. She cries to the Lumas, and exclaims that she wants to return to see her mother. But she can't, because she was asleep under the tree the whole time. It's very obvious that the girl in the story is Rosalina, and the home they built was the Comet Observatory. Rosalina spent the rest of her life caring for the Lumas, and preparing them for their futures. 
If you couldn't tell already, this story is an emotional roller coaster, but it's honestly one of the strongest parts of the game. I don't think I need to say it at this point, but I will. I fucking love this game's story, and I wouldn't change it for the world. Super Mario Galaxy released on the Wii, and as such, it's to be expected that it would have an unconventional control scheme. This game utilises the Wii Remote and the Nunchuck, and heavily uses the motion control and pointer capabilities of the controller. Pointing the Wii Remote at the screen will bring up a cursor, and the primary function of this is collecting star bits, which... Let's talk about this real quick. Collecting star bits is so goddamn satisfying. It gives a lot of incentive to explore these levels, and it's incredibly fun. They also have purpose, as a lot of levels and stars are accessed by giving a certain amount of star bits to a hungry hungry hippo. I mean... Luma. Giving the Wii Remote a mighty... Shit. ...will make Mario spin, and this has multiple uses. It allows for a bit more verticality when platforming, and can be used as a way of shifting momentum to correct jumps. You can also use it to break shit. Outside of Wii controls, Mario has a pretty standard moveset here. Jump, triple jump, backflip, side flip, wall jump, and long jump. And crouching and shaking the Wii Remote allows Mario to do a spin kick. Sick. You know what, this game actually controls really well, especially for it being on the Wii. Because, you know, I was expecting some parts with, like, precise tilt controls and... <sighs> spoke too soon. The Manta Ray and the Star Ball. They really aren't that bad. Each one requires precision with your tilts, but as long as you're strategic, it really isn't a hindrance at all. I mean, fuck motion controls. In all seriousness, Mario controls like a god figure in this game, and is an absolute joy to play as. The controls never feel awkward for me, even with the tacked on motion and pointer controls, it all feels incredibly natural and comfortable. Mario Galaxy was the first 3D Mario game to implement traditional power-ups, and there are seven in total. The Fire Flower, which is a timed power-up where you shake the Wii Remote to throw fireballs. The Ice Flower, which is also timed and turns you into solid ice, allowing you to create a nice platform on any water you touch. The Boom Mushroom, which allows you to float and shake the Wii Remote to become transparent, allowing you to avoid damage and travel through certain walls. The B Mushroom, which allows you to hold down the A button to stay in the air for a limited amount of time. The Spring Mushroom, which is basically what it sounds like. Mario turns into a spring and is bouncy and difficult to control, but the incredible amount of added heights to jumps is a plus. The Rainbow Star, which makes Mario invincible and seizure inducing. And last, but certainly not least, the Red Star. This is by far the most underutilized power-up in the entire Mario franchise, being used in only one mission, and then being optional in the Comet Observatory. You shake the Wii Remote to fly! That's it, this power-up is incredibly fun, and its theme is absolutely amazing. All of the power-ups in this game are fun. Yes, even the dreaded Spring Mushroom, which many seem to hate, but I actually enjoy. Other than the Red Star, I think all of the power-ups are utilized to an acceptable degree, and none of them outstay their welcome. Oh yeah, you can do some wacky sh** with gravity. This game introduces spherical platforms in abundance throughout the many levels, and this is all thanks to the outer-worldly gravity. Sometimes it can be a little weird to control, and other times, it's this. Honestly, need I say any more than that? This game is fun. What do I need to say? You've been watching gameplay, you've been listening to the music, what more is there to add? Despite how painfully underpowered the Wii is, Super Mario Galaxy is absolutely f***ing stunning. The atmosphere of outer space is captured perfectly in this game, and is reflected beautifully in the vibrant, colourful backgrounds of each and every level. It's honestly breathtaking. I often find myself just taking a minute to stop and look at the gorgeous backdrops, and when I did, I fell even harder for this game. The lighting is also incredible, and aids in the atmosphere. Character models are all high-poly, modern designs, and they're animated thoroughly and fluidly. Every character you interact with feels real, and that's something I really appreciate. Now if you can, imagine everything I just said, up tenfold with a bucket load of cinematic flair. The cutscenes are absolutely draw-dropping, and tell the game's story in an incredibly powerful way. The animation here is stellar, particularly in the opening few cutscenes, and they really help portray the heavier plot that this game has when compared to the rest of the series. And the music. Holy fuck the music. This is the first time a Mario game has had a fully orchestrated score. This was done to aid the game's more cinematic feel, and it works stupendously well. Each and every track has a grandiose, epic feel, and they all fit excellently within the levels they're found in. 
A few personal highlights for me are the Comet Observatory, Ghostly Galaxy, Honey Hive Galaxy, Gateway Galaxy, and of course, Gusty Garden Galaxy. Call me an exaggerative fanboy, but I absolutely adore this game's soundtrack, and there honestly isn't a single track on it that I don't at the very least really like. All in all, presentation-wise, Super Mario Galaxy blows past any and all expectations, and then some, and this is honestly one of the strongest aspects of the game. On the surface, the completion of this game seems fairly standard. You go throughout all of the galaxies and all of the domes, collecting all of the available power stars. On top of the base power stars, most levels have one or two prankster comets that appear at random, offering their own unique challenges in the stages. After obtaining a certain amount of stars, the Comet Observatory is able to travel to the centre of the universe, where Bowser is residing. Upon beating Bowser, purple comets become available in all of the multi-star galaxies. In these missions, you must collect 100 purple coins in order to obtain the stars, sometimes with over 100 and a timer, or exactly 100 hidden incredibly well. I really enjoy the purple coin levels, as they are another excuse to explore every obscure corner of these galaxies. They're honestly a blast. Throughout the game, you stumble across three green stars, and when you get all three, the trials of the green galaxies become available. These are the final challenges of the game. Akin to the watermelon, lily pad, and pachingo shines in sunshine, but these ones are actually bearable. There's 120 stars in all, and when you've got them all, you're able to rematch Bowser. But why would I do that, you might be asking? Well... Oh, hell yeah. Super Luigi Galaxy! Oh, hell yeah! Yes, a star becomes available in the castle grounds from the beginning of the game, and it's a purple coin star. This combines the sheer coolness of having the throwback with the fun of a purple coin star, and I absolutely love it. As for the second thing, well... Heading back to the file select screen, we see an icon to switch between Mario and Luigi. But like, what's the point? You need to have gotten all 121 stars to unlock this. Oh shit. In order to play as Luigi, you have to start the game again. Which means that for 100% completion, you have to beat the game again as Luigi. Luigi controls differently to Mario. He has a faster running speed and better jumping abilities, but he has way worse traction, sliding along the ground for a second after stopping, which can lead to falling or taking damage. I don't know if this was just me, but I also found that I got hit more easily as Luigi. Super Luigi Galaxy is its own campaign, but it's fundamentally the exact same game with a slightly different character. <laughs> and Lord knows I ate that shit up. That's right, after 100%ing Mario Galaxy, I jumped straight back in for Luigi Galaxy, and I loved it just as much. I 100%ed the game and absolutely fucking adored it. In a weird way, I actually enjoyed it more because Luigi is one of my favourite Mario characters, and this was his first playable mainline 3D rule, and something about it just felt magical. 100%ing the game is something that is absolutely not for everyone, essentially beating the game twice, but if you're anything like me, it'll be a magical experience. There's no real reward, but this game is so fantastic that just being able to beat it is reward enough for me, and I can say that I wholeheartedly recommend completing everything that this masterpiece has to offer. Super Mario Galaxy is one of the most joyful gaming experiences that I've ever had. I felt like a child again when I was playing this game, being more excited than I've ever been to kick Bowser's arse, feeling butterflies in my stomach upon saving the galaxy. Hell, this is the first time I've ever felt genuinely really happy about seeing Mario and Peach reunite, and that's really something special. Is the game perfect? No, but it's pretty damn close. I think I'm going to play through this game just one more time before I move on to the next one in the series. I mean, why not? I enjoyed it two times in a row, so three can't hurt. Son of a bitch!